Colonel Cohn was born in Germany. He escaped at the age, I think, of 13 and came to the United States. Uh, it was drafted into the U.S. Army and has uh, quite the story to tell you. Next to, to Frank is Jack Holder. Jack Holder was a U.S. Navy flight engineer at the, during the attack, and he was at the attack in Pearl Harbor in June of 1941. One. 40? No, I can't 41. 41. Shows you what I'm, it's been a, it's been a long weekend. <laughs> the, uh, he has flown more than, he has flown 58 missions over Guadalcanal and the Solomons, and 56 missions of doing anti-submarine patrol in the English Channel. And to my immediate right is Don Irwin, a U.S. Navy veteran who was present at the attack on Pearl Harbor and served at the Battle of Midway, the Marshall Islands, and the Solomon Islands before his ship was sunk by a kamikaze pilot over the English, excuse me, off Okinawa in 1945. Mm -hmm. So let's begin. You got us mixed up here. Am I do doing this wrong? I did get them wrong. Well, that's not unusual. So we have Frank Cohen, Jack Holder. On my, on my right is Jack Holder. In the middle is Don Irwin. Now I've got it. <laughs> Don't you love, a, love scripts that get in things in the wrong order? Uh, that's my fault. So let's, let's get off the ground here with Colonel, Colonel Cohen. Tell us, how did you give us a build up to entering the United States Army? Well, <clears throat> Of course, it started when I was born, and I had no choice. I was born in Germany in a city called Breslau, which is now Polish, at Rucklow. Uh, but at that time, uh, it was 1925, and by 1933, Hitler came to power, and uh, I happened to be Jewish, so I was starting to get into a segregation. <clears throat> and my father lost his, uh, his business. And eventually he realized he wasn't going to be able to support the family anymore. So in 1938, uh, he got a visitor's visa uh, to look for relatives to get a, uh, an affidavit so we could emigrate to the United States. Well, as chance would have it, uh, he did find his relatives, but they there was a depression, and they could not guarantee that he would become a burden to the state. So uh, he almost was told to go back. But in the meantime, the Gestapo came to our, our door and looked for him. And uh, my mother told, her, told them that uh, he was uh, on business in, in the States. And pretty soon she realized that uh, this was not going to turn out very well. So she went to the American consulate. And uh, they didn't have computers in those days, so they didn't realize that my father already had a visitor's visa. But she got herself a visitor's visa and uh, put me on her press board. And the two of us just walked out one fine morning and uh, got across the border and uh, to New York. We ended in New York on the 30th of October, 1938. The date was important because on the uh, 9th of November, just a few days later, is what, what uh, was called Crystal Night uh, happened. And that was a, an action uh, against the Jews by the German government. And they arrested anyone who they could get a hold on, burned the synagogues, and smashed the businesses, and that's why it's Crystal Night. Anyway, that was extremely lucky for us because uh, when that happened, uh, President Roosevelt issued a, an executive order that allowed anyone in the states to remain in the states and not be shipped back because we were really enemy aliens and were in, uh, under threat of being sent back. So we were able to be safe in the United States, but as enemy aliens, um, when the war broke out, uh, I could not enlist, but it didn't make much difference because I was 18 in August uh, of uh, 1943, and I was drafted in September 1943. Uh, so that went on real quick. Now, I spoke German, but somehow they missed that because most of the people who uh, were like me, who spoke German, 
went to uh, Camp Ritchie, Maryland, and had a six-month course in intelligence to be interpreters and interrogators. Me, I ended up in the 87th Infantry, and they shipped me out as an infantry replacement, and off I went uh, through England, uh, to France, to Belgium, uh, all the way up to Malmedy, and suddenly, finally, somebody discovered I spoke German, so they shipped me back to Le Vessinet near Paris, and I had a two-week course, which made me a experienced intelligence agent. <laughs> That's two weeks and you're an experienced agent. That yes. sounds like the military. <laughs> Next is Don Irwin. Don, as I mentioned, although I got it kind of screwed up in the beginning, the Navy veteran who was at Pearl Harbor and served in the Battle of Midway in the Marshall Islands and finally was on a ship sunk by a kamikaze pilot. So Don, how did you come to be in the military? What got you, what motivated you? What's your background? Where are you from? I was born in Eureka, California, in the Redwoods, and uh, swam in the ocean, swam in the river, swam in the lakes, and that's why I chose Navy. Uh, you, I, so you joined the Navy, you weren't drafted. What yeah, year was that? I wasn't drafted, I volunteered uh, June of 1941, and um, went boot camp down in uh, San Diego, and uh, Picked up a World War I destroyer and went over to San Pedro and picked up the uh, Virginia battleship and boarded the Enterprise carrier on October the 12th. Um, our guns on board the ship was 5 inch 38, 50 caliber machine guns, and a 1.1 pom pom gun. And uh, we Delivered airplanes to wait before the war started. Delivered airplanes to uh, Midway. And uh, we ran into uh, a storm. Made us a day late coming into Pearl Harbor. And we came in the day after. Loaded uh, supplies all night. And got fired at by the Marines because they were looking for a two-man sub. And uh, so uh, after the couple of runs that we made, the 50 calibers came out, the pom-pom guns came out, and they were replaced by 20 millimeter and the 40 millimeter guns. Uh, I was qualified for aviation middle smith third class, and um, I helped patch uh, a wing on an F4, F3. Uh, we made a raid on the Marshall Islands, and I was a lookout at the time, and the bombers came over, and the captain saw them and timed it, turned the ship off to one side, and the bombs hit where we would have been. Um, we had an airplane that dropped out of the formation and came up behind us, and he had no idea what he was thinking about. But the tip of the wing flew along the flight deck, and then he fell into the drink. <laughs> Next to him, we have Jack Holder. Jack, as I mentioned earlier, I'll, again, I kind of got a little confused. But Jack was a flight engineer at, uh, during the attack on Pearl Harbor, and he was also president of the Battle of Midway. So Jack. I know you've written a, a terrific book. I've had the great opportunity to read that book. Can you tell us how you came to be uh, at Pearl Harbor, how you came to be in the Navy, and, and uh, a little bit about your own background? Well, that's pretty easy. My father was a farmer, and anyone who knows anything about farming knows it's a lot of work and very little money. I soon learned that my life was not going to be consumed by farming. I seen a little literature on the Navy. It looked, it looked promising. When I was in grammar school, by the way, I walked a mile and a half to school. I grew up in a, I grew up in a small four-room shack my father built. No running water. No electricity. No telephone. We had an outside toilet and a Sears and Roebuck catalog for toilet paper. 
and uh, no bathtub, of course. We take a bath in the, we had a creek that runs through the middle of our property, 360 acres. What state was this, Jack? It's Texas. Big state of Texas. <laughs> any rate, uh, when I started high school, I was transported seven miles in a green 1927 Model A Ford truck, wooden benches down each side for seats, canvas across the, around each side for curtains, and you can imagine how damn cold it was in the wintertime. When I was 18, fresh out of high school, I persuaded my mother to sign the papers. I was off my own way to the Navy. Incidentally, my last job prior to joining the Navy, I was cutting prickly pears with a long handled shovel, piling the pears so the cattle couldn't eat them. And, uh, I had calluses on my hand you couldn't believe. When the doctor in the Navy had examined me, he said, what in the hell have you been doing? He then told me I had appendicitis. I went to the hospital, spent a month, come back, went through two months of boot training. I then applied for and was accepted for aviation machinist make school for four, four, another four months. I arrived in Pearl Harbor December 12, 1940. I was one of six days short of one year prior to when, when Yamamoto arrived. I was a flight engineer, or plane captain was called in the Navy, on a PVY, which uh, was built in 1935 strictly for a search and rescue, but after the war started, it was used for everything, of course. At any rate, uh, I had the duty that day. The section lead, we just fell in for muster and the section leader began roll call. We heard a screaming aircraft and moments later, a terrible explosion. We run outside in the hangar beside us. We received the first bomb that fell in Pearl Harbor. Incidentally, they hit a, an empty hangar. It was VP-21. The, the, the squadron was in the Philippines on advanced base training. But at any rate, all of our aircraft our aircraft, which were only two weeks old, we just delivered them from San Diego. Uh, half of them were on fire, and uh, when the, when the uh, noise noise came, we all ran outside, seeing our circling aircraft overhead with a rising sun and a signal. We knew exactly what had happened. One of my shipmates remembered that uh, there was a sewer line behind our hangar under construction. He says, let's go for the ditch, follow me. We all ran, jumped in the ditch. One of the uh, Japanese pilots seen us, circled, strafed the ditch, hit the dirt piled up beside the ditch. This was a two-way attack, of course. First one was at 8 o'clock, the next one was an hour and 15 minutes later. During the uh, lull between the first, uh, we looked up Battleship Row and seen Devastation I can never forget. All the battleships were sinking, on fire. And uh, late in the afternoon, machine gun pits constructed from sandbags that were built all around Fort Island. I had the pleasure, along with two shipmates, for manning one of them for three days and nights. On the fourth day, we were relieved. We went to the barracks. And we were given a postcard with two inscribed inscriptions. One said, I've been wounded. The other says, I'm okay, don't worry. My mother received this card 11 days later. My father said she was in hysterics, of course. He said she got on her knees and prayed to God if he would protect her son, she'd spend the rest of her life working for the church, and she did. When this was over, we all, I'm not through. <laughs> Yes, sir. At <laughs> any rate, when this was over, we resumed all of our duties, patrolling every so around Pearl Harbor. And following uh, Jimmy Doolittle's raid in Tokyo, uh, intelligence began receiving uh, coded messages using the letters AF and AO. We had broken the Japanese code to a point, but they, they could not ascertain what these two meant. They knew one was. Uh, Lucian Islands, the other was Midway, but they couldn't determine which one was which. 
chief of intelligence told Admiral Nimitz that I've devised, devised a plan to ascertain what they mean. We'll send out a coded message, an uncoded message saying, Midway has just had a freshwater condenser failure. The Japanese took the bait, said AF has just had a freshwater condenser failure. Nimitz and in disguise sent a small task force to the Aleutians, sent three uh, aircraft carriers to one position in the uh, Midway, the rest of the fleet in another. I left Midway June, June uh, 28, 1942. On the third day, we found the Japanese fleet 450 miles from Midway. I happened to be in the second aircraft to spot the Japanese fleet, but it so turned out that uh, we could have been considered first. The first aircraft which was sent to the Enterprise, had a garbled message, but they did receive ours. We sent ours to the Yorktown. At any rate, the Battle of Midway, we were certainly losing the battle for the first two hours. Wade McCluskey, General uh, Lieutenant Commander Wade McCluskey was leading a, a three squadron uh, attack of, uh, of, of dive bombers running low on the field, been airborne two hours. They said, we want to press on just a moment longer. Moments later, he's seen a white wake of a fast-moving destroyer. He says, that ship has to be racing to join the main fleet. We'll follow it. And again, in just moments, they found three aircraft carriers, and in four minutes, diving from 20,000 feet, they sunk all three. They were aided by two things, of course. Japanese fighters were at low altitude protecting their own ships from our torpedo planes. And uh, the ship under the command of Admiral Nagumo was uh, replacing the bombs they had loaded with torpedoes. So it was a stroke of luck. Admiral Spruance called Randall Nimitz and says, we've had a good day, Admiral. We just sunk three aircraft carriers. Do you think that's enough? He said, hell no, I want the fourth one. <laughs> and the hero was found sometime later and also sunk. They come to Midway with four carriers and left with none. That's quite a story. That's quite a story. I, I left uh, there, I went to Guadalcanal, spent Flew 48 missions over Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands. I then received orders to travel to San Diego, supposedly to help commission a new PBOI squadron and return to the Pacific. My orders were changed. I started training in the B-24 Liberator. April 1943, I was in Dunkswell, Devonshire, England. I flew 56 missions over the English Channel. Sunk one submarine there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, quite a story, Don, and, and, and I do recommend this book. It gives you great detail and, and additional background. Uh, Frank, I'd like to come back to you. It's, uh, can't quite imagine you, your family barely got out of very difficult circumstances. Come to the U.S. You, you were too young to, to join when the, when the war started, but you finally got inducted. And, they missed the fact that you spoke German. So I'm kind of curious, when you got into the field, you were in combat arena, and you're, you're, the fellows in your squadron uh, or, your, or your patrol knew that you spoke German. How did all that kind of come together for you? And was it a, especially, uh, was it a, an extra help that you could help, that you could understand the, uh, the enemy? Well, <clears throat> the, the uh the art of speaking another language was extremely important. And uh, that is why these, all these refugees who were able to be linguists were all put together for training. And then uh, when I came in from uh, Le Vesene, uh, I was placed into uh, an IPW, Interrogator Prisoner of War Team number 66, that consisted of uh, two officers, uh, uh, one driver, one NCO, and two linguists. So there were just two of us in that interrogator prisoner of war team. And the team uh, ended up uh, in a 
a larger unit called T-Force, which was task force uh, under 12th Army Group, immediately under Bradley. So this was pretty high up, and we operated in uh, the Third Army area and the First Army area, so throughout Germany. And the mission was to go into the big cities as they were captured, and we would have dossiers on personality and building targets. The personality targets were people under the automatic arrest policy to be tried as war criminals. And the uh, personality targets were anything that was going to be of use to the occupying force, to include uh, the Nazi headquarters, the uh, uh, governmental headquarters, um, any army installations, uh, as well as utilities and industrial complexes. On any of those, we would go in uh, to get a, uh, an estimate as to what the assets were of that particular uh, uh, function uh, that we had, uh, rather the uh, installation that was found, and we would make preliminary reports to be exploited later on. Now, when I came in, uh, we, of course, were still in Belgium, and we hadn't entered uh, Germany. So uh, what happened about a week after I arrived, the Battle of the Bulge started. And we were now, uh, uh, first of all, we had to leave in a blackout move and go towards Liège. We never got to Liège. We got to Namur in Belgium. And there we set up. Uh, and uh, the report was that there were Germans who had infiltrated into our lines, four in a jeep. And they were uh, doing all kinds of harm in back of our lines. And our mission was to find those. And we started our, re our, uh, uh, our ex uh, a reconnaissance to see where we could possibly intercept them. Now, our team never intercepted one, but we did meet an infantry unit that had uh, come upon one of those uh, uh, jeeps and they had taken their bazooka and had wiped it out. And there they were, four Germans in American uniforms in a Jeep spread out on the field. We searched them. The only thing we found on them were dog tags, which we turned in because they obviously were either prisoners or had been killed. Uh, I got one quick story about that. Please. Um, and that is, you always ended up saying, the, uh, the side which made the least errors was the side that won the war. And errors were all over the place, and so it was with us. Uh, we made this uh, reconnaissance. We came, uh, and it was miserable. I mean, the weather was just god-awful. It was much worse than worrying about being shot, because you, you got that cold wind, and it was either snowing or sleeting or raining, and never saw the sun, and that's why no airplanes could fly, and that's why we were in trouble for quite a while. Anyway, uh, I was the lowest ranking one, a PFC, and I was always in the back of the seat of the Jeep, which was good, because I could get behind the captain, and he got the worst of the blast. <laughs> anyway. Uh, There's a lesson there for you all. <laughs> Well, pretty soon we saw the captain didn't know where we were, and that's not healthy. So we urged him to stop at a, uh, a place where there was a military unit, an American unit, on a little hillside, and there was a lieutenant up. Uh, they had drug out a table, and black, uh, maps were on the table. We said, let's go find out where we are. So he said, OK, Cone, come with me. We'll go up there and find out. Well, he didn't want to admit he was lost, so he says, I'm Captain Rumpel. Military intelligence, give me a briefing of the situation. Well, <laughs> the lieutenant that he talked to wasn't much impressed. He looked him up and down. He said, I don't know who the hell you are. And uh, we got reports about four Krauts. They called the German Krauts. Four Krauts in uh, American uniform. You guys look just like it. So he said, well, <laughs> we're not. We're Americans. He said, OK, what's the fifth general order? Well, all soldiers knew their orders, 12th general orders there. Had they asked me, I could have come up with a 
He didn't know. I said, okay, um, who won the World Series? He looked at me, I looked at him. We hadn't known who won the World Series, so he <laughs> couldn't answer that one. I said, okay, Star Spangled Banner. He said, oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light, uh, 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 he got stuck. <laughs> In the meantime, more people come around, and uh, the other interpreter down there saw something was wrong, so he came running up, and he had the worst accent, like Kissinger. He said, what goes on here? Well, that's all that was needed. <laughs> the M1s came into my belly, into the captain's belly. Hands went up. We were now prisoners of the war of the Americans. <laughs> well, it, it took him nine hours to figure out that we were legitimate. And the lieutenant said, get the hell out of here. The captain gets it. I don't want anyone to say one word about this to anyone. <laughs> no, sir. We got back to the headquarters. They came running out. Hey, what goes on here? They had heard the whole story because they had to check and to see that we were in the German. It is Never amazing in, in the, some of the most difficult circumstances in all of our lives how little funny stories come out of that. One last question for you uh, that has fascinated me. You were uh, at the Elbe when the uh, Americans and the Russians hooked up. Uh, I can't quite imagine uh, Given the, the experiences of the Russian soldiers and the, and the, the very the horrendous difficulties that they had faced, as you guys hooked up, what was the atmosphere like there? Well, this was really very interesting. Here, uh, it was an historic event. Of course, at that point, we didn't know that. And uh, the captain had received a top secret uh, map which showed the uh, occupation zones. And the Alba, of course, was the delineation line. We were not to cross it, and the Russians were not to cross it. Well, actually, they were the Soviets at that time, so it was more than Russians, but let's say Russians. Anyway, the captain had gotten an order to go across, see the Russians, and tell them, stay where you are, because their occupation zone really went to the uh, east side of the Alba, where we were sitting in Magdeburg and even a little further back, all the way to Helmstead. But the, the, the mission of him was stay there, it'll take us a few months, and then when we draw back, you come across, but not right now, because they didn't want any trouble of getting these armies mixed up. So he's looking for a Russian interpreter, he can't find one, he turns to me, he says, Cohn, you're my interpreter, come with me. Now I know I don't speak any Russian, I knew one word, tovarich, friend, that's it. Uh, and I'm trying to get out of this. And he said, I don't care, carry the map. So I carry the map. He gets himself a German uh, a boatman who, who took him across. In the middle of the river, he stood up to make sure they realized it was Americans. And when we ended up on the other side, it was like he and I had captured all of Germany. I mean, they greeted us like mad. They embraced us. Uh, they gave me, first of all, a, a shot of vodka. Well, I was 19 at the time. I never had a vodka in my life. I had one drink, and I knew that was it. No more. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I was useless. I couldn't speak anything. They couldn't speak anything either. So the captain was taken back, and whatever happened, uh, finally we came, and we, we went back, and because of that meeting, 50 years later, I'm invited to Moscow to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the meeting of Soviet and US forces at the Alba. That's cool. Don, let me turn to you. Uh, you, you had uh, mentioned that uh, you, or, uh, you you'd mentioned the Doolittle Raid. When you met up, well, I guess, with the wasp and, and... Hornet. The hornet, that's it. The hornet. Did, were you aware of what was going on or what was about to happen? Uh, we knew we were headed towards Japan, and then finally the captain announced that we were going to make a B-24 raid on uh, Japan. Uh, in the meantime, uh, in our progress, a picket ship that was beautifully camouflaged, 
deep blue and white caps, and that was the color of the water. And they reported the mast on the horizon, and the mast was going like this, so it was a lot closer than a mast on the horizon. The picket ship went between the Hornet and the Enterprise that I was on, and the heavy cruiser opened up uh, fire and made a big water spray, and the Helen light cruiser number 50 blasted away, and I think the picket ship finally sunk because it had so many holes in it. So we had to launch the B-25s earlier than we wanted to. And um, if you watch the movie uh, about the Doolittle raid, the seventh airplane that took off almost hit the drink because the guy didn't have his flaps down. Oh, oh my goodness. And then later, uh, you were on a, on a ship sunk by a kamikaze pilot. Yeah, we uh, went into Iwo Jima and we gave the Marines fire support and star shells during the night. And um, we had uh, a, a Japanese cannon that bracketed us uh, with four shots and he hit our torpedo tubes and killed one fellow with shrapnel in his back. Uh, from there, we picked up a group of LSTs and headed for Okinawa. And at that time, I was mount captain on a five inch 38. If you go five times 38, that's the length of the barrel. And um, so we uh, got a word that the bush was in trouble and sinking, and so we went over as a picket ship and uh, to help uh, shoot down uh, kamikazes. Now, the kamikaze interpreted as divine wind. And if you go back in history, China was going to invade Japan, and the wind came up and the storm came up and sunk most of the Chinese and the Chinese called it the divine wind. Well, they took that interpretation and put it on the kamikazes as the divine wind that they were going to be saved from that. We shot down two uh, Japanese airplane. We got hit uh, in the engine room. The ship went dead with power, and my mount was all in manual control. And uh, the last airplane came in, uh, was headed for Mount Four, where I was, and I found out from James Pollock that was in the 40 millimeter just ahead of me that a, a fellow jumped 14 feet off of the mount down below to get away from the hit. When I got the one blast and saw the explosion, uh, the airplane still coming in. I closed the hatch, and I guess my eyes were big because the tr fellas inside asked me what was wrong, and I said, hang on. And it hit alongside of us and uh, had shrapnel hit the side of our mount. And uh, we had uh, one fellow that in the Japanese pilot, he was blown up and part of him was over the, over the hand line and a lot of blood around. And one of the sailors that was down below hatch, he came up and he died right there at the hatch. He got steam cooked. Yeah. Not, not a pleasant sight or a pleasant memory, I'm sure. No. And uh, how old were you at the time? Uh, 23. 23 years old. And you had, uh, had really already seen quite a lot of action. So ladies and gentlemen, we have here uh, two gentlemen, from, one from the Pacific Theater, one from the, uh, from the European Theater, and a man that had experience in both theaters. Uh, uh, Jack, was there a difference in command structure, a difference in the way things went, uh, other than the, the, uh, the given the fact that, uh, that you had all that experience in the Pacific Theater and then you come to the Atlantic Theater? 
can you differentiate or can you just, is it war is war and it's all hell? Well, it was all war and it was all hell. However, there's a vast difference in the two. Uh, for instance, uh, B-24 crew, well, most people don't realize that the Navy ever had B-24s. We had five squadrons there. They were trying to control the uh, uh, submarine, uh, German submarines in the channel with PBYs, which was ineffective. So they commissioned five squadrons of B-24s. I was in the first squadron, VB-103. The uh, five squadrons flew 6,364 missions over the channel, sunk eight submarines, damaged four more. I managed to get one of them. But uh, there's a vast difference in, uh, in the command and everything. Uh, the English against the Japanese. A lot of the English, uh, they wanted things run their way, of course, you know. But uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we had to wear the Royal, Royal Air Force uniform with American flags on the left shoulder. So things like that is, it was about the only difference. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a, a few minutes left for a few questions. So. Uh, before we wrap up, do we have any questions for any of our panelists? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Mitch Mendoza from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, each of you have entered the military at a young age. Uh, do you believe this transition from your youth into a soldier uh, has played an important role in the development of your career in the military? Did you hear the question? You each entered the service at a pretty young age. So what was the impact on you as you transitioned from really being a teenage kid to, a, to a, a fighting man? How did that impact you, and how did you make that adjustment? Is that for me? Yes, sir. <laughs> you're sort of drift into it. I, <laughs> it, it you're, you're not cognizant of what is going on. It's amazing. Uh, uh, you, as a young kid, you adjust to the situation as it progresses. Uh, you, you, at one point you're a refugee and you worry about certain things that you hear from your adults and you're able to cope better than the adults are in, in that respect. Uh, when, when war comes, uh, it, it just creeps up on you and all of a sudden you're under fire. There's artillery fire coming on. So you take cover. Uh, you see that everybody else takes cover and you do the same thing. That's how you're trained, really, by looking at the guy next to you. And you, you really don't know if he knows better than you do, but you think he does and you do what he's doing. Uh, uh, one, one time, for example, uh, uh, we had gotten into a uh, German concern in, in uh, Cologne the Germans were on the other side of the river, and they had noticed our jeep, apparently. And the mortar fire came, and it was one over, and you know, you better get the heck out of there. So we got back into the jeep and moved out, and uh, the other one was short, and the next one would have been exactly where the jeep was uh, standing. So uh, <laughs> this was personal. I mean, usually it's impersonal fire. This was personal. They were aiming at me. And <laughs> you, you, you get sort of religious at that point. <laughs> and uh, say, why the heck are they trying to kill me, you know? Uh, but you adjust to it, and uh, that, that's the way it goes. Don, you were only 17 when you entered the yeah, service. Yeah, it was easier for me to go into the service because uh, I had my own gun, did a lot of shooting, and uh, in the military, uh, I was got an expert badge and put on my uh, uniform, and I did I shot 50 caliber machine guns, the old pom pom gun, and so I I was at home with shooting guns. So you were fairly comfortable with the transition. Yes. And and how about you, Jack? You were 18 years of age. And uh, I'd like to uh, make one statement there to all these uh, young people that's uh, going to be our future. Uh, you got, you know, especially for the enlisted man, boot camp and the rest of the Navy 
changes a boy into a man. You'll, you'll find that out. I sure did. Yes. And they do it in a pretty short amount of time. That's exactly right. Uh, if, and the one thing that I, I, I relate to is that it's not just the sights, it's the sounds and the smells. Yeah. And that's what cannot leave me. So how did that, how did those sounds and smells along with the sights, how did that impact you at such a young age? Let me tell you one little story there. We're all lined up uh, uh, after a long drilling section on a, on a parade field. We're all standing there at parade dress and uh, our, our commander was a, an old a chief gunner's mate by the name of Sartorius. I'll never forget him. And uh, we're standing there, you know, and he says, okay, sailors. He says, I want you to round out those white hats. He says, I know some of you are pretty, pretty salty, but the most of you still smell from cow manure. <laughs> <laughs> Any, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's time for us to move on to the next part of our program, so please join me in thanking our panelists.